I'm joined once again by Josh Young, Chief Investment Officer of Bison Interest uh, Fund, investing primarily in oil stocks. Josh, welcome back to the show. How have you been? Uh, I've been good. It's been a, a wild ride since the last time I was on. Yeah. So, Josh, the oil price itself has been a wild ride, having gone from literally negative in April 2020 to over $120. Then stocks that produce and sell, explore, you know, that that oil and natural gas, they are volatile. So you get a wild ride on top of the wild ride. You uh, you specialize in an extremely wild ride of those small and middle cap producers that uh, are, you know are, are smaller companies, so you know have a lot more leverage, so they can be quite volatile. So it's it's been a roller coaster of you know penny stocks to they've they've gone up a ton and. Uh, you know, small cap stocks, is it fair to say, you know, since the peak in prices, they've actually exploded higher from, you know, April 2020 to let's say, you know, June, but it's been a rough uh, few quarters as the price of oil has fallen. And meanwhile, uh, large cap stocks, ExxonMobil, you know, stocks in the XLE ETF, they keep on marching higher, uh, which is, I guess, a little confusing. Is that a rough, is it what I said, roughly accurate? Yeah, that sounds right. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I was chatting with someone about this this morning where, um, you know, it's so interesting that the large cap producers are pricing in essentially 80 or $85 WTI. And at the same time, the small cap producers are pricing in 50 going on 40. Um, and so it's a very weird thing. And, you know, of all the markets related to oil and gas, I think the one I trust most is the large cap producer equity market because there's just so many different participants. You have everyone from literally Warren Buffett buying some of these stocks uh, through index funds and fund flows in both directions and giant hedge funds that are able to leverage up 100 to 1 on some of their, their more aggressive bets. And so you really have, I think, a, a pretty efficient market in the, the shares of, you know, the Exxons and Chevrons and you know, the other ones sort of in those large cap indexes. And so I think when I look at them, that's sort of the, the place to go in terms of understanding what the reasonable market expectation is for oil and gas uh, pricing going forward. And then also sort of what a reasonable sort of market clearing uh, cost of equity would be for an oil and gas stock, sort of liquidity independent. And you know, if you strip away some of the uh, headlines as well as some of the manipulation that you see in commodities. The cost of equity. Tell me what you mean, how you value an oil stock. I feel like on the one hand, they can be easy to value. You just plug in the price of oil. But on the other hand, they're actually you know, much, much more complex in terms of how to, how to how value them. So how do you how do you value? What do you mean by cost of equity? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're super complicated. What I was referencing was purely the um, if you look at the sort of consensus investment bank estimate for sort of intrinsic value for these, they're all building very complicated uh, models and they show sort of what oil price they're inputting and then they get target prices and they'll build out these really complicated um, discounted cash flow models. And so what what I was commenting on is when you look at those, and again, they're precisely wrong. So they're they're never right. They always have a lot of assumptions and a lot of other problems in terms of their modeling. And my take is a lot of that time spent modeling is best for them to do, not for me to do, and I'll just use them. But when I look at sort of the consensus around them and I look at what oil price is going into those models at you know, assumed costs of capital, right? Assumed discount rates, assumed other factors. There's, it's possible to get an implied oil price out from that sort of calculation. And then um, one of the uh, easiest ways to do that is many of the bulge bracket banks will actually identify what price they think is implied for oil in the stocks of those companies. So it's sort of a way to uh, sanity check my my estimate for those. And so you know, I've seen various investment bank estimates recently uh, indicating you know an implied oil price for Exxon, for example, might be over eighty dollars a share, or sorry, eighty dollars a barrel. Uh, Chevron, similar, Oxy, sort of similar. So when you look at these things, it's helpful. Again, you look at the models. You also just can listen to what the banks say in their research about what price they think is implied. And then from a cost of capital perspective, I mean, it is interesting. These uh, larger producers are getting to a point where they're they're still cheaper than sort of average stocks in the overall, let's say, S&P 500 index, but they're not nearly as cheap as they were, let's say, a couple of years ago relative to that index. So, you know, it's pretty, I think it's, it's an interesting, helpful exercise to do. I think it's really important to understand sort of where one's 
personal variant view is and to try to, to sort of understand what the market is saying as best as possible to try to take sort of targeted strikes in terms of uh, targeted non-consensus bets rather than sort of being <laughs> purely non-consensus. And, and this sort of exercise is helpful in terms of understanding um, how others think about the market as well as perhaps how the largest and best informed market participants are, are uh, understanding the market as well as expressing their, their views on it. Key to value an oil stock is the price of oil, but then what it costs to produce it. And there's, you know, Various ways, but I think the, uh, there's something, something called the break-even cost. It's my understanding that uh, the break-even costs in some of these smaller cap uh, uh, names were actually quite high going into 2014, 20, uh, and the, the price that cl- collapsed you know, caused a lot of investors a, a lot of pain. So maybe it's sort of uh, they, they have uh, anguish from that, and they're 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 reluctant to to get in. Uh, what are the break-evens like now? Uh, in, in other words, if the price of WTI is, I don't know, $78, sort of how much money are some of these firms, the smaller cap, the, the world that you work, you, you sort of uh, thrive in, uh, how much money are they making a barrel? Yeah, so I think, so there's two big changes that have happened since 2014 for small cap oil and gas producers. One is that they have way less financial leverage now than they used to. So a lot of these companies came into 2014 with, two to four times debt to EBITDA or debt to cash flow at $100 oil, $120 oil. So when oil fell to 50, they were at eight times debt to cash flow or 10 times. And in many cases, those companies went bankrupt. So the average debt level is way lower. um, So that makes them a lot more sustainable. And then like you're saying, the cost structures were sort of bloated. So if you look at the number of employees per barrel produced, or you look at the total dollar GNA versus either revenue or barrels produced, um, it's way smaller. The industry is way more efficient. You know, some of the, the announcements you've seen from sort of the big tech companies recently are sort of a similar idea, right? Where if you have the, the same business, you can choose to run it Uh, sort of with more, let's say, R&D or more marketing or more other stuff, or you can sort of cut it down to some of the people that you think are necessary. And then if you have a very long downturn, you redefine what you think is necessary and you end up with way, way fewer people. So it's been very painful, I think, from a people perspective for uh, the oil and gas industry. But what that's done is dramatically lowered the cost of production Um, One of the other interesting things that I think people sort of miss when they're thinking about oil and gas producers is there is a difference between conventional and unconventional producers in terms of their uh, production decline rate if they don't reinvest. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about the sort of total cost of production or, or thinking about sort of a heuristic of, hey, what's the operating cost per barrel for a company, I think it's appropriate to attribute the uh, replacement cost or the the maintenance capital that's necessary to sustain production in that sort of uh, cash flow break even per barrel. And so a lot of the smaller producers actually have much lower production decline rates than some of the larger independents. The the super majors have sort of different issues. So they might have lower decline rates, but they'll have um, agreements with various uh, uh, various what do you call it, uh, state-owned oil companies. Mm -hmm. And so those expire after a certain amount of time. So they have the equivalent of a high decline rate, but it's sort of structured differently. Um, But on on domestic production in the US or Canada, typically the smaller producers these days have a lot lower production decline rates. So let's say that a producer might cost them $30 a barrel all in to produce their oil versus let's say on the small side versus a larger producer, it might cost them, let's say, $20 $20 or $25 a barrel. But if that smaller producer is only having, let's say, a 10% or 20% decline rate, that means they might have to reinvest half or a quarter as much of a large producer that, again, their break even might be, let's say, $20 a barrel, but they might need to spend another $20 or $30 a barrel just to sustain their existing production. So when you include maintenance capital expenditures, it sort of even things out, evens things out a little bit. And depending on the oil field services cost environment, there's actually some significant advantages that low decline producers have over high decline. And again, it's sort of counterintuitive, but a number of the smaller companies, not all of them, but a number of them are sort of on the low end of the production decline perspective. And then the one other factor there, and this is sort of, it's, it's complicated and sort of messy, but it's worth identifying, 
especially in the world in a world where people are talking about windfall profits taxes and other sorts of um, regulatory and tax issues for producers, some of the smaller producers and even some of the mid-sized ones have very large tax shields. So they took large losses historically, or they bought uh, shells or bought companies that had sort of large losses embedded in them. And in many cases, these companies are sitting on uh, 10 years or 20 years of cash flow worth of tax shields, whereas some of the larger producers are actually becoming taxable this year uh, to the tune of having to spend 20 or 30 percent of their cash flow in uh, in taxes. So it's a very, I think there, there are these other factors that have sort of been forgotten because it's been many years since oil companies were paying large cash taxes. And uh, some of the politicians that were very upset about the low cash tax bills a year or two ago, maybe, I don't know, they'll, they'll still be upset at the industry, they'll blame them for something else, but uh, there's a lot of taxes that are gonna get paid. And some of these smaller producers and some mid-sized producers are sitting on very, very large, um, you know, net operating losses or other sorts of categories of um, tax shields that will allow them to to sustain a, a lower tax bill, which actually net effectively lowers their their cost of production. I didn't know about the small and mid-cap companies that have a lower decline rate. I, I, I had actually sort of my you know, assumption was kind of the opposite. And it, it was, as, as you say, uh, in, in you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, the cost to reinvest in a, a frack, you always have to pour money back, back in. Uh, and, and that just cost a lot of money. Uh, how much, how much of it, how much of this is, is fracking? And then tell me about conventional versus non-conventional, which is which is the one that has a lower decline rate? Yeah, so conventional production typically has a much lower decline rate. And it also helps that when you're drilling a conventional well, generally you're either not fracking it at all or you're doing a much less expensive uh, completion to bring the well onto production. Um, but again, there's also, there's challenges with conventional production, which is that you have to explore for it. It's not as sort of, you know, shale isn't homogenous, but it's sort of reasonably thought of as, as close to homogenous, where you sort of have an idea, hey, if I drill a well here and then a well there, that the well next door may be pretty similar to the, the prior one. Conventional wells are, are much more complicated, especially on sort of initial production. But once you're on production, especially if you have a water flood or CO2 flood or some other sort of method to essentially uh, squeeze out additional oil from a reservoir that's been producing for a long time, generally your production rate is quite low. Um, it's sort of similar to the Canadian oil sands where, where there it's not um, it's not conventional, but it's a similar idea where you have a large resource and you're just sort of slowly extracting it either with uh, steam or with mining or whatever. And so um, it's sort of a, a, that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end, you'd think of a shale producer, especially in their early stages where they're ramping up production, spending maybe more uh, money on drilling completions than they're making on, on the cash flow from production and growing a production base that has a base decline rate of over 50% a year. Some of these companies initially had 70 or 80% decline rates because you know, they'd bring on a bunch of wells and they would all have that decline rate and that was all of their production. After a few years, that sort of initial 70 or 80% decline rate from a well might go down to 20% or 25%. And so, you know, one of the companies I own that has exposure to, to shale actually has a quite low decline rate because a high percentage of their production of their wells were drilled a number of years ago versus recently. Um, a number of the larger independent shale producers that people know quite well actually have pretty high corporate decline rates because they've just sort of stayed on this shale treadmill and tried to grow. So like one that people know really well is EOG here in the U.S. And um, that one actually has a, I think when people look at it, they get surprised by the very high production decline rate. And again, it's a best in class company. They're great at operations. They're great at finding new oil fields and extracting tons of oil from them. But they're also fairly high cost when you include the cost of replacing the production that declines off every year. People should look up what the EOG stands for. <laughs> well, it was, it was Enron Oil and Gas, right? Yeah, it was yeah. prior to... Prior to Enron's implosion, they were sort of the oil and gas production. I mean, Enron was a pipeline company mm -hmm. and, you know, they got into various other things that got them into trouble. And the oil and gas producer aspect, um, you know, really credit to uh, Mark Papa, who who led it, brought it out of um, 
out of that sort of corporate parent. I mean, you know, he did an excellent job over decades and earned well above average returns uh, as yeah. as CEO of that company. Um, but you know, <laughs> there's no reason in in downplaying it. It's a uh, it's Enron Oil and Gas, and now it's uh, EOG, and you know, they were the you, one of the non fraud aspects of Enron. Josh, I, I feel like. Uh, there's a narrative going on, you know, let's say two years ago, definitely three years ago, that companies, oil companies are so much more disciplined than they used to be. And when they make money, they're going to buy back stock and pay dividends. In other words, give it back to their shareholders instead of putting it right back into the ground. And, you know, uh, folks in shale as well do have a little bit of a re reputation of, you know, they like to drill holes. They, they like to, uh, uh, get the, the oil out. And, you know, I think uh, you know, their reputation to some degree uh, is because that's what they did in 2012, 2013, 2014, always just, you know, I think they were incentivized. Uh, CEOs were incentivized based on production instead of profitability. And the narrative that that is, is different. Uh, two years later, how would you say uh, that, that, that argument has played out? Uh, what have you seen that corroborates it? What have you seen that, that maybe challenges it sort of how would you judge that thesis uh you know with the benefit of hindsight that is a great question so i think it's sort of mixed so i think on the oil producer side oil producers have done a quite good job of staying disciplined on their capital expenditures on the gas producer side gas producers went crazy and it doesn't seem like they went crazy because the gas rig count is still a lot lower than the oil rig count. But when you look at gas production, it's just astonishingly high uh, relative to, uh, you know, the, the gas production growth has been two or three times higher than gas consumption growth. And so um, for producers that produce a, com a combination of oil and gas, this has been a real problem. Um, but the, the oil tilted ones, or at least the ones that are producing oil primarily and then getting associated gas, um, you know, they've been, I think, much more careful in terms of not uh, growing aggressively. And then also there's been a sort of public-private divide where when you see, and you actually see it even today, um, very recently Oventiv, a mid-cap oil and gas producer um, acquired three companies from NCAP, a private equity fund. And those companies, I believe, were running seven rigs. And Oventiv's plan for those companies, for those assets, once they own them and integrate them, is to run only two rigs on those assets. So they're going to take it from seven rigs, which was a rapid growth high decline, uh, very unsustainable from an inventory perspective business plan, and they're shifting it to running two rigs on those assets, which will allow them to go from essentially a few years of inventory to 10 years or more of inventory on the assets that they purchased. The, the purchase price is complicated. They paid a really high price, especially given the plan to only run two rigs on those assets. Um, but it's still, I think that sort of highlights the public producers, especially on the oil side, have done a really good job and they have been under investing relative to their cash flow. They're finally <laughs> repaying some of the debt that they put on to grow as much as they did historically and maybe even repaying their shareholders a little bit. It's not excess profits, it's just actually starting to recover the capital that was lost in prior years. Um, and then on the gas side, it's really been unfortunate and there's been just wild growth that um, I guess the gas producers just looked at how much money the oil producers were making and just decided to opt out of that and uh, to drill to grow volumes. What is it do you think about natural gas as well that caused producers to sort of swerve from the discipline that they had uh, previously committed to? And I'm sure, you know, the price of oil exploded higher, you know, over $120, but the price of natural gas, if you want to talk about you know, absolutely ridiculous. Um, I mean, you know, the price of natural gas in Europe, I don't know, was up 50 times or I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you're American producer, you're producing at $2, $3 for Henry Hub and you're selling it at $9, you, I'd be, I'd be pretty, you know, you'd be pretty incentivized to, to produce. So yeah, what, what is it just about natural gas or, or is it just the, the price? So one of the things that is happening for natural gas that isn't for oil, and it's sort of the bull case for oil is to some extent the bear case for gas. So one of the things is that shale well productivity for gas has continued to improve. While shale productivity for oil, so if you're drilling a well in West Texas in a, and let's say the Wolf Camp A, Wolf Camp B in sort of an oil bearing formation, um, your well is likely to produce less than a well in that area three years ago, all things being equal. 
And even with improvements in technology, the production per lateral foot of well is, is going to be lower probably uh, and on average than um, wells that were drilled a few years ago. Um, gas wells per foot in, let's say, the Haynesville or Marcellus are actually in many cases, I think the Marcellus might be peaking, but the Haynesville got way more productive. There were real improvements in there are real improvements in uh, efficiency. There are real improvements in just raw productivity. So the a- absolute volumes of gas coming out of these wells increased. They also realized they could drill three mile laterals or more. So just put more pipe in the ground and get even bigger wells, which makes adds for efficiency, especially in places like the Haynesville where you're drilling 10,000 feet down before you can drill lateral. If you can drill a three mile lateral instead of two, or even four mile in some cases, you can get some significant additional cost savings. And there is a tendency for those longer laterals to work better for gas, where there's just lower odds of stoppages or other sorts of issues and um, less well for oil, where there's just sort of the, the fluid mechanics versus gas mechanics for flow, or obviously it's much easier for gas to flow than oil. So I think there's a there's a productivity aspect. And I think that productivity aspect made it very tempting for gas producers to drill incrementally more productive wells, even though they sort of understand that if they all do it, there's sort of this game theoretic problem where they end up flooding the market. So it's not, I think some of the shale production uh, decline or, or flattening out for oil it is related to this sort of failure in the growth of drilling productivity and well productivity, rather than there sort of being just everyone sort of discovering religion. And I think that's important from a policy perspective too, when you think about it, because some of these companies are doing both, right? They have oil wells, they have gas wells, and, and actually generally oil wells will also produce gas for the most part, but there are many gas wells that are dry gas and they're just producing 100% gas and no oil mm-hmm. or you know, 99% gas and a little bit of condensate or some other natural gas liquids that are closer to gas, let's say, than to oil. So to, to answer that question, um, but when you think about it, it really, I think it, it better explains the shift in the industry where you have folks who were overly aggressively drilling. It's not just pressure from their shareholders. It's also that it's gotten increasingly difficult and expensive to grow production in onshore U.S. shale oil. And I think that's where investors can get more comfortable. It's awkward because the drilling efficiency is diminishing and the drilling returns at a flat oil price would be getting worse for these producers. But the And so I think it makes it hard for them to actually admit it and talk about it. But flip side is this does mean that shale oil as a growth source is going to disappoint to the extent that there aren't much higher prices. So I think it's part of like a a super bull thesis for oil, but it's also very complicated, I think, as an oil and gas investor. It's part of why I care so much about low decline producers, as well as producers at very low valuations, such that there's room if the whole industry just comes clean and admits sort of this problem in terms of diminishing well productivity, um, there's room for a company at, let's say, two times EBITDA to expand that multiple, even if people understand that drilling productivity is not so great, because one, you're going to have higher oil prices, but also in that scenario, but you're also just at such a low valuation, you're, you're not really getting any credit for improving well productivity anyway. What have you seen on the cost front? I know in, in gold stocks, which you know, it's my understanding that you don't, don't really invest in at all, you know, everyone says gold, uh, gold and gold mining stocks are great inflation hedge, and there's reasons for that. For that. However, since June 2020, uh, or the summer of 2020, when the price of gold was at an all-time high and inflation was, was quite low, uh, since then, the price of gold has gone down. And then the cost to actually mine the gold because of inflation got bad. So, so gold mining stocks um, you know, have gotten hammered. The price of gold has, has rebounded uh, significantly over the past few months. Inflation, on the one hand, part of the reason we have inflation is because the price of oil goes up. So good for you know, oil businesses. But if the cost to withdraw that gets very high, then that's, you know, hurts the profit margin. I think there's a similar issue for oil producers. So uh, there has been significant cost inflation. Um, it's part of, again, why um, I, I guess I can count the number of times I say low decline producer, but low decline producers are significantly advantaged in this because if you don't need to drill new wells, when the cost to drill new wells, when the cost to complete new wells escalates, like it has, 
um, you're not hit by that. So it's still hurting you when you have to replace a pump or when you have to pay for various other things um, that are necessary to sustain production and recompleting wells or doing some of the other workover type things, again, to sustain production gets more expensive, but your overall cost structure doesn't rise as much as if you're drilling new wells very actively, which again is an issue if you're growing or an issue if you have a high decline rate. So that is in general a problem and costs across the industry rose a lot. Um, but again, it's sort of a bigger problem if you're a higher maintenance CapEx, higher decline rate, sort of more down the middle uh, EOG, Pioneer, Devon, et cetera, sort of shale producer, or the shale operations at sort of the majors at Exxon, Chevron, et cetera. What would be an example, I guess, perhaps from the large cap universe that you, you may not invest in, as well as from the small cap universe that, that you do invest in, of a ultra low decline company? On the large cap side, it's sort of hard to find. I think sort of the, one of the larger um one of the larger uh, low decline producers is Denbury, which I think I think I saw either got bought out or is getting bought out um, and and traded at a, a pretty high valuation and and that news and, and I'm going off of memory, which is a little dangerous in a <laughs> recorded interview, but it's okay. Uh, you know, pretty high valuation um, and and pretty large cap. Uh, stock. I think they were producing close to 100,000 barrels a day and just, you know, multi-billion dollar stock, pretty pretty well traded. Um, and, you know, lo low decline producer also, but again, I, th I think they got taken out and it would make sense that they would get taken out because whomever it was that bought them would have probably seen their production decline fall quite a bit. And I, I did actually own some of those warrants a while ago. Um, they, were, they emerged from bankruptcy and there was just a great trade. It was very asymmetric. Um, where you got sort of higher oil price exposure um, through the warrants and didn't have to necessarily take a lot of uh, capital risk. Um, I didn't own the equity, which, you know, the, the warrants did amazing. The equity did well. Um, and I'm, I'm not involved and haven't been for, for a right. while now with them. Um, so that's an example of something I don't own that's low decline. Um, and an example of something I own that's low decline is Journey Energy, which uh, I've talked about a number of times. And I think the it's funny because you can talk about something and I feel like people will like glom on to one aspect. So they have a power business, which is great and people aren't really focusing on. And I'm hearing about some private transactions in that area that are at valuations that are astronomical relative to what's priced in. I mean, I don't think anything's priced in for them for that, but you know, if you see a 10 or 15 times EBITDA private market transaction for a nearly identical asset, nearby uh, that should be promising for a stock at a very low EBITDA multiple that's getting no credit for that. But the, the, the thing that's just the most interesting about Journey is you have this asset base that's very low decline. I think their oil decline rate right now is in between 10 and 12% annually. So the amount they have to reinvest, and they're spending something like $20 million um, to uh, sustain their production relative to an expected production rate of about 13,000 barrels a day, uh, over half of which is oil. And so, you know, very low reinvestment requirement. They're going to spend a little money on growing that production and investing in uh, additional recovery from it. But I mean, it's sort of sort of wild when you look at that versus other companies of a similar size that have to spend five times that or so just to sustain and keep production either flat or growing slightly. Hey there, sorry to interrupt. Announcement. Blockworks is hosting an event called Permissionless in September. It's a crypto event. It's in Austin, Texas. We did Permissionless in 2022. It was the biggest and best DeFi event in the world. And this year, lightning will be striking twice. Historically, our ticket prices have gone up about 10 times from the day the tickets go live to the day before the event. If you're like me and bad at math, that's 900%. So it might be savvy for attendees to consider buying tickets now rather than later. If you're listening to this and you're saying, hey, Jack, I'm not really into this whole crypto thing. I want to hear about the Fed. I want to hear about the dollar, Bretton Woods, three, four, five. I hear you. I'm not telling you to buy a ticket and the interview will resume momentarily. However, if you are into the crypto thing and permissionless is something you might want to attend, what I'm saying is there's no time like the present because tickets will go up and if history is any guide, prices will go up a ton. Anyway, the link is in the description and you can get an additional 10% off by using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. You know, everyone's going to tell you that they're different. Everyone's going to tell you, oh, we got the best well, we got the best. You know, how do you how do you tell what's the real deal? Who's telling who's telling you know the, the straight straight stuff? 
So one of my uh, friends years ago who retired years ago, uh, I remember there was one conference years, you know, uh, must have been 10 years ago or something where he had, had came out of a bunch of one-on-one -on -one meetings with management teams. And he was saying, oh yeah, they're slinging, they're slinging stuff out there. You know, there's just, they're sort of making stuff up and sharing things that don't make a lot of sense. So I think, I think the best way to approach public markets is just to assume everything you're hearing and reading is wrong and to be very, very skeptical. Um, that being said, the best way to start out knowing a company is a low decline producer is that they say they're a low decline producer, right? Companies will generally communicate some of their best attributes in their corporate presentations. They, they do tend to leave out their worst attributes. So often what I'm spending time on is not sort of what they advertise because generally what they advertise is going to be directionally true. It's more of what they're not saying. So, um, you know, when you look at Journey, uh, if they say they're a low decline producer, you can do that quick test in terms of CapEx versus production and see that, you know, <laughs> they really don't need to spend very much money to not have their production implode. Um, but, you know, there's other questions around the, the uh, cost of production, like you were asking, and other sorts of factors. And, um, and I think sort of the big thing for them and, and some of their competitors that are in the power business too, or in other businesses in addition to oil and gas, is understanding how much of their capex is actually going to those other things versus going to their oil and gas business, and and that's an important distinction because um, you know if you attribute let's say their sixty million dollar capital budget all to their oil and gas production, you're going to get sort of one answer for capital efficiency. If you say, oh wait a second, they're spending twenty million dollars building or buying power plants right now, and another twenty million dollars on investing in this stuff that in three years is going to show something, and then. 20 million keeping their production flat, that I think is helpful. And you obviously have to chase those things down and make sure you believe them to want to give, or for me to want to give a company credit for it or to not give them credit for it. Um, but I think I think it's generally, it's generally the companies are good at highlighting the particular factors that they're good at. And then it's the rest of it that um, that I'd, I'd be skeptical of. And the one thing I would I would um, question, generally the, the production decline rates when they disclose them tend to be pretty accurate. And usually companies are only disclosing them if they're exceptionally low decline producers. Um, I think the thing that companies have been less honest about, and this is sort of well known at this point, is uh, drilling inventory and sort of the amount of locations they have left as well as the returns for those locations. And there again, it's not that they don't have the numbers that they'll say, it's that often the returns numbers or inventory numbers don't have the appropriate factors deducted or aren't properly burdened. So they'll disclose sort of what they're burdening them with, but then they won't mention the things that, you know, if you were a cash investor in a well, you don't necessarily care about the, the gap or adjusted gap uh, measures on it. You care that, that that gets you to, let's say $7 million for a well, you care that, the bill for your portion of the well is effectively $10 million for that well. So mm -hmm. you want to, I think, um, vet these things pretty carefully. And uh, I think that's where sometimes people get in trouble um, on evaluating these sorts of companies. So I know a, a name you uh, were in and you got out of uh, was Baytex. What went on there? If you could you know, briefly remind us of your, your bull case and you know, it did, did go up a lot. And you know, what were the reasons that you decided to exit the name? Sure. So um, there, there's sort of the tangibles and the intangibles. So the tangibles are, um, I was in it for basically two reasons. So one, it was a levered producer that was rapidly delevering and was at a low valuation. And so the thesis was that as they paid off their debt, that amount that of debt they paid off would go into their market cap. And then, so their enterprise value could stay flat and their stock could actually go up a lot. Like it could go up 2x or 3x relative to that entry point at, let's say, $1.50 Canadian a share. Um, and I think I exited around five fifty or 6 Canadian a share, something like that. So it went up about 4x. About 2 to 3x of that return was purely just on this deleveraging based on – they didn't even need higher oil prices, and most of that deleveraging happened at $75 oil or lower. Um, and they had a lot of hedges that sort of locked that in. So it wasn't that they – over earned at 120 or anything like that. It was just, it was a very solid business. It was misunderstood. And there was this deleveraging that was happening. There was another aspect that, and, and that was sort of well known, like you could figure that out without any sort of exceptional analysis in the middle of 2021. 
Um, and, and it wasn't really priced in because people either thought oil prices were going to go down a lot or they just thought that it wouldn't matter and that companies that paid off debt would derate, which again is not the, the finance theory and also not what I've seen in my career. Like generally, if you're at four times EBITDA and you're like one and a half times uh, market cap EBITDA and two and a half times debt EBITDA, if you pay off that debt, you're probably getting to four times. Maybe you're getting to three and a half, maybe you're getting to five. Uh, usually you get actually, uh, it's not even one for one, it's sort of two for one market cap increase versus debt pay down, depending on the situation and run rate multiples and all that stuff. Uh, and so that that worked out. Um, I think that the, the edge on Baytex was that there were uh, production results that were in the public domain that they filed with the Alberta energy regulator that were on their website, the energy regulator's website that weren't press released. And even once they were press released, the stock went up a little, but not a lot that indicated that they had highly productive uh, resource that they had uh, the rights to on a first nations uh, area, uh, essentially the equivalent of a reservation in the U S um, and that they were going to be able to go and drill dozens, if not more, ultra high productive, ultra high rate of return wells. You said to be able to interpret it correctly. They drilled uh, dual laterals that were very cheap and that came on a little over 100 barrels a day. You had to understand that they would be able to take those, drill longer laterals and drill eight of them instead of two per sort of well bore. It was a sort of weirdly like new, but also very old technology to drill a bunch of laterals out of a single well bore. And the Baytex was able to effectively do that. There were other operators in nearby areas, like 40, 50 miles away. So not a different province, but also not immediately adjacent. And understanding that this resource was very similar to the one that these other operators were drilling, as well as understanding that they'd be able to get a multiple of their production because these wells weren't fracked. They were drilled open hole. They're, they're sort of quasi conventional. They're heavy oil, but they're mm -hmm. sort of conventional in terms of the way they're produced. Um, so there isn't that much uh, well interference by drilling eight laterals versus one. Um, and, and there were there were some other aspects that made it very likely uh, to be very productive. Over a couple of days, I found a number of different heavy oil experts and folks that had drilled similar wells, either you know in various capacities as geologists, as engineers, as CEOs of companies, as you know service providers, and, and vetted sort of the, the results that I had found and, and bought that stock heavily. And so that was the the thesis was they had this thing that was worth a lot, this new discovery, along with a just sort of pure bread and butter deleveraging play that was pretty low risk and that was going to work under a variety of oil prices. And sorry, Josh, you, you were bullish on the stock before this news and then you bought more or this is part of your original bull thesis. I, I don't think I've, I've heard about this before. Oh yeah. So, so, I mean, I owned a little bit of it just because they, they were deleveraging, um, you know, let's say it was a few percent position and I upped it tremendously on, uh, on these well results that I had been tracking because I owned a little bit of the stock. Right, right. Um, there was also a duration debt to some extent where they, they had refied their debt in January of 2020. And so they were very, they had covenant light debt that was a, a big portion of their overall uh, debt position that they were extremely unlikely to get put into bankruptcy from. And so they were, they were sort of unusually well positioned for the amount of financial leverage that they had, which again, made it a very sort of comfortable thing to own in small size on a deleveraging over time bet. And then you take that and you combine it with a, a major discovery and that, that made it very exciting. But the thing that, that got me out really was the sort of combination of the stock re-rated and they, right. they did delever. So that the sort of check and it got above where I would have expected absent the discovery, but it became clear that the discovery was worth a lot relative to where the stock was trading at $1.50 a share, but it wasn't worth that much relative to where the overall company was worth at $6 a share. And so just when you look at the sort of overall enterprise value for the business, and you look at this value of this discovery, it was worth let's say a few dollars a share, but it wasn't going to get you this next 4X or 8X or 10X or whatever out of this field. And they were indicating that too, both because they weren't, they bought a little more land, but not a lot. They didn't really get very aggressive in terms of exploring for other sorts of areas in that general sort of uh, Clearwater, Clearwater-ish uh, fairway 
And, and so this was, they were treating it as sort of a discrete discovery. They were developing it out. You could do the math on it. You could figure out what it was worth. And it was worth a lot, but it wasn't worth many times where they were trading after the stock had already re-rated multiple times. So, you know, great company, really happy with that result. Um, you know, there was a path for them to get another sort of five to 10 X over time, but with some of the steps they were taking, again, great company, they did sort of what I expected, but they weren't doing the next things that I would look for. Um, and that I expect of companies that I'm, that I own that, you know, I'm always looking for that sort of multiple times return and asymmetric return and without the deleveraging and without some of those other activities, um, it made sense to sort of sell and, and redeploy elsewhere. The price of oil is something that it's so hard to predict, but if you knew the price of oil was going to $300, Hey, yo, oil stocks are going to do well. And maybe you, some stocks do better than others. Depends on, on the leverage, depends on all the characteristics that you've talked about. But, you know, likewise, the price of oil goes to $5. You know, I don't think the uh, oil stocks are going to do that well. Um, what, what is your general sense of uh, the, the price of oil? I know you have a, a long term a bullish thesis. And, you know, bullish thesis played out you know, extraordinarily well. Uh, price of oil went over, over $120. Since then, you know, it's declined and you've, you've had a lot of, of chop. Uh, I think now it's it's around 78. Yeah, I mean, how, 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 what have you made in the past six months? Yeah, it's been, it's been really frustrating. So I think there's been a few things happening um, concurrently that have been price negative. So China's reopening has been a lot uh, slower and sort of more choppy than... Um, than you would have expected. There were a few things that opened up real fast out of the gate. And then there were other aspects that have been, um, you know, like they, they only started awarding visas very recently for international travel. And they've been sort of slower on uh, facilitating international travel to certain places. So that's really held back their, uh, their flight count by quite a bit. And then you know, China's economy is doing quite poorly. And so um, their lower industrial activity is really cutting into their oil demand. They're still at or close to all-time high oil demand right now, but um, they're at a point in their S-curve where what, at, from their economic growth perspective, they're at a point where even though they may actually have, if you ignore their fake numbers, real negative GDP, they're still actually ha on a per capita basis actually increasing their oil consumption because yeah, they're building fewer high-rises that are empty, but there's more people with cars that are gas powered and that are um, you know, driving around. And there's all these cities that people are moving into and they're buying gas powered scooters and gas powered cars and diesel buses. And they have a lot of electric vehicles too, but their, their ramp up of, of gas powered vehicles is enormous. And they're at a point again, where they can, they can suffer a lot and still grow. So that's sort of been, there's been a little bit less sort of one-sided, just pure oil demand growth in China and more sort of some of this choppiness. So that's been tough. Um, the financial ownership of oil is down tremendously, it essentially collapsed over the last year. And some of that was- oil, but the contracts. Yeah, yeah, futures. yeah, futures market contracts. And, and, and that's sort of the, you know, the sentiment went from, let's say pretty bullish a year ago to very, very bearish. I mean, almost every headline is negative. Even headlines talking about oil prices going up are bearish. Uh, there was a, a bearish OPEC cut, which is interesting because I imagine if OPEC had increased their production, how bearish that would have been. Um, so, you know, the, the sentiment around things are negative. And, and that's where, again, I think it's so interesting to look at these large producers uh, and what's priced in there versus the futures market. The, the producer equities are just so large that, that it's sort of, and, and the money that's, that's bet on those and the sophistication of the people involved there, um, I think it's actually far superior to the, the uh, forward market for oil futures, where you have a lot of folks that are in there who are forced to participate um, in terms of, you know, hedging their airline business mm -hmm. or their producers and just forced to sell forward a certain portion of their, of their production. So it's sort of a more interesting market, I think, on the equity side. Um, so I'd say, I'd say those are sort of the two big things. There's a lot of uh, negative news on, um, you know, recession and so on in the U.S., Canada, Europe. Um, the reality is that oil consumption is actually surprised to the upside in most of those places. And there's actually, it looks like a weird sort of economic recovery in Europe to some extent for now. Um, so I'll take it. I mean, you know, again, like it's hard to tell and I have low confidence in saying that, but um, your know, consumption has been very healthy um, despite sort of this very sort of these negative headlines. And the thing I think that's most exciting 
um, beyond just on the demand side is there are a number of countries that are seeing significant economic growth that are at a point where they're starting, they're getting to that start of that S curve where they're gonna, you're gonna start to see demand increase substantially on a per uh, dollar of uh, per capita GDP basis. So, um, you know, as you as you grow from sort of uh, $2,000 to $10,000 of per capita GDP, you just see an astronomical increase in consumption of oil. And, and those are not inflation adjusted numbers. Maybe that's 5,000 to, <laughs> to 20,000 or something today. Um, but, but you think about places like India and Sri Lanka and various other, uh, you know, Pakistan, there are places in Vietnam where Chinese manufacturing is being relocated um, or formerly Chinese. So like Apple is ramping up in India, for example, mm-hmm. that's huge for oil demand. Yeah, it's, it's bad for China, but China is actually not really seeing much of a drop in oil demand. They're just growing their oil demand less. And it's really pushing oil demand up a lot in these various other countries. So we're seeing this just sort of broad emerging market, frontier market growth and oil demand. And it's really hard to find. I mean, the Apple story for India is easy because you can point us out that there is investment. Um, But that's sort of a broad movement. And it's pretty exciting from an oil demand perspective when you think about those places taking share from manufacturing from China and then having some of this sort of structural CapEx driven oil demand growth and OpEx, and then China actually having pretty healthy oil demand despite their economic issues. So you could end up, it's sort of win-win for oil, uh, this sort of broad trend from a demand perspective. So the supply, I think we talked about last time, you know, it's not hard to find, right? There's not enough investment to be able to really grow oil supply substantially. OPEC is sort of tapped out. That's part of why they had to cut their production the last, uh, you know, last October and then mm-hmm. recently. Um, so you're sort of in a, in a capped supply environment and lots of negative demand headlines. But it just, I mean, <laughs> here we are. Supposedly we're in this terrible recession and like roads are crowded and flights are packed and the airlines are guiding up and flights are still increasing in China. We still have a thousand more international flights a day to go to get to 2019 levels. And apparently for this holiday that's happening in China uh, soon, apparently uh, it looks like flight bookings are 10 percent higher than in 2019. So again, right. bad economy in China and 10% higher flights than 2019. I mean, that's a pretty good recipe. And some of those airlines, uh, some of those uh, planes are uh, more fuel efficient than they were in 2019. The, the fleet's been high graded, but mm-hmm. that also is helpful because that keeps their operating costs low, which means that they can fly even more flights and charge even less, which creates even more demand. And uh, there's a book people should read called The Bottomless Well, which talks about how um, the more efficient we get with things, the more we use of the things. And it's sort of oh, for sure. why it's why oil production or sorry, why oil demand probably just keeps growing, even as we have electric cars and more efficient planes and so on, because there's just generally there, as long as something's available, there's a one directional uh, movement in the consumption of the thing. I saw something on Twitter and I, you know, I don't want to seem like, you know, like I'm passing myself off an expert. That's just something I saw that so much of the marginal demand for oil in China is in that industrial production that you already said. And I think a lot of that is producing refined products where, um, uh, you know, uh, so it's, it's based on throughput. And I saw that the uh, throughput was already quite high even during uh, um, you know, uh, the lockdown. So yeah, in America, if you had a, I'm just making a number up, you know, 200%, 300% increase in, in flight demand, that would be a very, very bullish story. But if, if in China, the marginal demand for the barrel is coming from industrial production and that was already high, it might not be as bearish. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've encountered that argument. What, what, do you, what do you think of it? I think the, the sort of near-term oil question is really, does did China peak for demand? So some of the same folks claimed that China demand for oil peaked last year. And there is strong evidence that that's not the case. And when you look at sort of net flows for oil and products to and from China, you see that there are significant draws in China right now between their oil and products, that that oil is going into China and it's not coming out. Mm -hmm. And there are additional flows of refined products, but there's even more flows of unrefined oil coming in and just sort of an aggregate you see there's been roughly a million barrel a day step up in oil consumption 
in China year over year. And actually the a precise year over year is even bigger because I think there was a lockdown in China around this time, like precisely one year ago. But sort of in aggregate, um, the overall demand is up about a million barrels a day year over year. And the real question is, from my perspective, do we sort of stay there or do we see another one to two million barrel a day step up in Chinese demand over the next year or so? And that's going to really drive whether oil prices go to 100 or whether they go to like 250. Um, you know, China steps up to 100 is your is your low ball. OK, yeah. 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 I think I mean, because China right now is consuming, you know, and, and the numbers are all sort of funky because it depends on if you include um, natural gas liquids and other sorts of things. So everyone has different sets of numbers and it's sort of this like mess trying to um, there's people that focus on this and they don't have right answers or good answers either. Um, but let's just say like last year was 15 million barrels a day. And this year right now we're at sort of 16 million barrels a day of consumption. Um, I think, I think the, or maybe a 14 to 15, I don't remember the exact, but just sort of directionally. Um, and the, the real question, the reason to think about sort of emerging markets outside of China is I think this sort of industrial slowdown, if we're at, let's say, 15 now, we were at 14 last year, we're getting to, let's say, 17 of, that's a, a full million barrels a day, more, or maybe 2 million barrels a day more than China produced at its peak in, or consumed in, in 2019, um, that, that might be sort of the limit for China in terms of their growth for a while. So they're, at, they're in this S-curve, there's sort of structural demand growth, which overcomes, I think, a lot of that industrial demand concern and loss, mm -hmm. um, and then some. And again, you can just see in terms of the number of cars on the road and then the number of flights that weren't taken. And between the two of those, you end up with, and and then uh, streets that aren't blocked off because of physical lockdowns that were really extremely uh, well enforced. So when you look at, at that in aggregate, you see that there is this extra demand um, net of refined product exports. So, so, you know, let's say 15 over 14. And the, the real question is, do you get to 16 or 17 or does it keep growing by a million barrels a day a year into the future? And so my expectation is that you, you get to this point over the next couple million barrels a day of demand, whether it's six months from now or 18 months from now that trying to get to this sort of, let's say 17 million barrels a day, where, where they, they have real trouble growing that further, where you end up with this, mm -hmm tremendous negative wealth effect from real estate and slowing or, or just, you know, uh, uh, industrial depression and other sorts of challenges um, that, that just make it real hard. You don't normally see oil demand fall uh, in aggregate in a country absent sort of lockdowns. Um, but I think you just, you, you get to a point where you might have, let's say 5% year over year personal consumption growth for oil, and then 5% year over year or more industrial demand loss. And you just sort of end up with a wash. Uh, again, I think we're growing too fast right now. And it's too easy for demand to grow just as those international flights step up from the 800 or so daily a year ago to, I think we're at about 2000 a day right now and get back to sort of the 2019 level of 3000 and then let's say add 10 or 20 percent so there's this big flight pull and jet fuel is great for oil demand because it's super high octane so you're ending up pulling a lot of the energy out of the barrel uh to, to use it uh, for jet fuel and then um gasoline demand really the, the two of those should help a lot in terms of seeing demand growth in china and that's why you know i think it's important to not like China's not booming. China's just reopened. Their services economy is doing great. Their goods economy is struggling. They're, they're talking a lot about incentivizing further goods consumption. Their industrial economy is suffering a lot. And again, it's sort of this big, complicated, giant country with 1.4 billion people of whom only a tiny fraction still have cars or gas-powered scooters. So you're still in this adoption phase. And you know, people can be a little poorer, but if they have a job, they're going to, and they can afford it. And there's been a lot of wage inflation. They may go and buy a scooter. They may go and buy a cheap car. And generally the worse people are doing, the more likely they are to buy a gas powered car, gas powered scooter versus electric powered. And so, and the more, the more stressed financially China is, the lower that EV adoption rate is going to be. So, you know, last year EVs grew a hundred percent year over year as a percentage of the fleet in, I think it was as a percentage of the fleet in China or just the total sales were up by about that much in China. Uh, this year so far, it's been only about 20% or so year over year growth. So 
um, that slowed a lot. And I think that's reflective of a struggling economy there. So, you know, again, I think it's sort of, it's one of these things where it's so easy to fixate on any one thing, good or bad. And the reality is that oil is this sort of global market that's really complicated. Almost no one gets it right. I get it wrong a lot. It's just from my perspective, it's like, okay, so holistically, like what's going on? Where are sort of the real problem areas? Where are the real sort of promising areas and sort of focusing on some of the contentious spots or some of the sort of poorly understood spots allows us to have sort of a little bit of an edge. And that that indicates that the world oil market is probably, I mean, it's not even my analysis at this point. Like you look at the EIA and you look at a few other agencies and you have a over 2 million barrel a day deficit in the second half of 2023. And so even if you have a recession in the US, even if you have some other stuff going on, and a drop in a million barrels a day of demand, you're still a million barrel a day undersupplied. And then those numbers are probably too low by a little bit. So you probably are in a two and a half million barrel a day undersupply with no big recession. And even if there is a recession, you could see. So again, just getting into the specific numbers, that's like why I would say, I think, I think you see much higher prices because, you know, recession mode, you might still see a hundred plus dollar oil, no recession mode, you might see oil go way higher. Deep depression, obviously oil prices could fall a lot. They could stay low for a little while. And then you just see you know, central bank printing, you see a lot of fiscal stimulus worldwide, and you could see oil rocket on the backside of that. So in sort of any of those scenarios, over time, oil should do quite well. Hey there, sorry to interrupt. A lot of Forward Guidance listeners are not into crypto. If that's you, please skip ahead, get back to the interview. Some Forward Guidance listeners are into crypto, some own crypto, a smaller percentage owning lots of crypto, and a much smaller percentage work at crypto hedge funds. If you're in those latter two categories, BlockWorks Research might be a good fit for you. BlockWorks Research is a research and data platform that analyzes governance, tokenomics, and models of interesting crypto projects, including new protocols. There's a lot of edge that can be gained from reading these reports. You can check out a sample report at www.blockworksresearch.com slash research and hit the free report toggle. If that is of interest, full subscriptions can be purchased at www.blockworksresearch.com slash sign dash up. You can also get 10% off using the discount code guidance 10. Thanks. And let's get back to the interview. Just returning to investing in the stocks. Uh, how many, if at all, if any, companies that you invest in uh, are outside of the U.S. or Canada? That's a good question. So I have I have exposure outside the U.S. and Canada, but I don't think I have any equities that aren't traded in the U.S. or Canada right now. So I, I have exposure to some offshore projects on the producer side. I have some exposure to offshore drilling rigs and services equipment. Um, that that's not U.S. sort of focused, but um, the the majority of my exposure right now is uh, the vast majority is is U.S. and Canada, just because there is a lot of geopolitical risk globally as well as in the U.S. and Canada, and it's sort of I think easier to understand to some extent these companies as well as um, especially on the smaller cap side. I mean, there are companies that are cheaper in the U.S. or cheaper in Canada with low production decline rates that. I mean, they're cheaper in many cases than buying a Russian oil company or buying a Chinese oil company or buying a, you know, X, Y, Z. I mean, th- what's an a- example of a, of a super, super cheap one? I mean, I, I would say journey, right? You just, if you, if you just do the value investor thing and you, you extract out their power business and you give them some multiple for it. So whatever, right They're they're um, in the process of turning on it works out to be about 30 megawatts of power. So recent transactions would imply somewhere between three and $5 million a megawatt. So if you extract out a hundred, $150 million of value for them, you're paying almost nothing for their low decline production, right? You're paying a fraction of recent transaction prices for production and you have a business that they're growing. So I gave a low multiple on the power gem, but they're growing that over 100% year over year. And you have a low decline producing business that's also, uh, they keep doing these accretive acquisitions. So that's an example. I mean, if you try to buy an equivalent of that internationally, you're either going to pay a very high multiple for the sort of power generation uh, setup if it's in an undersupplied market like Alberta, um, or and again, uh, equivalent to Alberta, um, or you're gonna have to pay a lot for a low decline producer 
that has sort of the property rights that they have along with that sort of large original oil in place with a low historical recovery rate on it. So that sort of thing would be quite expensive to get, even if you were trying to buy it in Nigeria or South, mm -hmm. South America or various other places. So wait, so, sorry, I missed it. What, what was the sort of multiple for, for Journey? So um, the, the multiple on the, the production, I think if you net out their power, you're at like a sort of two-ish times on, on operating cash flow, I'd be three times, depending on the exact oil price that you're, that you're underwriting, which again- Roughly two to three with the $80, $80. Yeah, with, with $80 oil with, um, you know, 10% <laughs> decline rate. So 12% decline rate. So you're really like not having to reinvest much of the money you're making. You're just sort of sitting on it. Um, and then they keep buying more production. Um, and one of the tricks for them is because of their geographic footprint, they've been able to buy production for a low price, uh, but they can pay slightly more. There's not a lot of competition when you're buying 2,000, 3,000 barrels a day of production. There's really not that many companies out there trying to buy these things. They can buy production that's sort of stranded, that's in one of their areas. They can redirect the gas production into one of their gas plants, and they can get an uplift on their margins on their gas. Plus, um, they change it from being a high-cost asset to a low-cost asset if they move it from a plant where they're paying, let's say, $2 an MCF for the gas to get processed to moving it to their plant where it costs them 30 cents an MCF to get processed. Plus they get the, you know, they get to essentially keep that extra dollar 70 or whatever in MCF. So even when you're buying oil, typically you're getting gas along with it. And so that sort of infrastructure advantage on the gas side for them has been pretty big. And then on the oil side, similar sort of idea, you end up with some economies of scale. And it's weird to say that about a 13,000 barrel a day producer, but um, you know, you start with, <laughs> they had 8,000 a few years ago. And so as they buy stuff and as they grow it, uh, they have some some sort of embedded advantages. And I think there's not quite that same sort of asset market available um, outside the US or Canada. Like if you try to, if you have a field and you want to buy assets nearby, the odds of those assets coming up for sale, if you're in XYZ foreign jurisdiction are often, you know, you don't have very good odds. They're, they're much more, um, opaque and uh, lower transaction frequency markets. So I think there's some expectation that you can, if you own an asset in an area where many other private operators own an asset and you're in West Texas or Central Texas or Alberta, almost anywhere in Alberta, there's a decent chance there's gonna be assets in your area that come up for sale. And then if you're located well, like they are, you sort of have this like uh, embedded advantage in, in these sorts of acquisitions. And so what's an example of a name that is as cheap, if not cheaper uh, than, than Journey? Like what is the, the absolute cheapest? It could be one that you were favorably inclined to, or it could be one that you actually think, hey, it's cheap and it's, it's cheap for, for a reason. Vital Energy, which I talked about uh, recently. Uh, it's a West Texas producer. Uh, so it's higher decline rate than Journey, uh, but it's in an area that, um, that we've just literally seen transactions for enormous valuations. Uh, enormous price tag. So Aventive just bought an asset like we talked about earlier in the Permian. Um, so Vital, they have these fields in West Texas. They produce some gas, some oil, some NGLs, uh, pretty low decline rate. They're, they're trading at half of the value of a recent transaction within you know, 30, 40 miles of them. Um, and they have a lower decline rate. They have a similar amount of inventory and if they got a similar valuation to this transaction that literally just happened, and again, Vital is not officially for sale or anything like that. They are publicly traded. Um, you know, they could, because they have more debt than they have equity. So again, this is sort of one of these deleveraging specials. Um, there's room for them to sell for a 200% premium to where they're trading, just in line with recent market transactions. So, you know, I like sort of the, the sort of like grinded out growth prospects for journey more, I'd say. And I think like the power generation business is brilliant. And if the, the current transaction comps indicate a hundred, $150 million Canadian of value for journeys power biz now, um, over a few years, given the growth rate they have for that, it could be worth more than the whole market cap. But, um, today if journey sold, you know, maybe they get, you know, a few dollar premium, 50%, 70, something like that. Uh, if Vital sold today, I think they have a good shot. And again, the, the only thing that would hold them back is they're already publicly traded. So I feel like some buyers might be embarrassed to pay a 200% premium for another publicly traded company. Um, 
because people can see just how cheap it was before. But excluding that one factor, it would be so easy for someone to come in for a pioneer or, you know, there's a number of different large diamondback, be very easy for them to buy it. Um, everyone's negative on their assets, but when you dig in, the more you dig in, the more you like them. Why are um, they negative? On, why are people negative on them? So they're negative because there's a, a history like for many cheap stocks. So one of the, one of the problems was that uh, under a prior management team, they had made some claims about a higher oil percentage on their legacy assets. And over time, as they slowed development, the gas percentage on those legacy assets rose a lot. And so they were really sort of a mixed like oil and liquids rich gas producer. And they had represented themselves as an oil producer and people really didn't like that. And activists got involved and fired the old management team, replaced the board. And so- Is that why it changed its name? Uh, sort of, although it's been a few years since that happened. So then the new team, um, you know, they're, they're not, they're sort of <laughs> not in that grinded out mode, but one thing they did that was really good and interesting was they identified that there was a perception of an inventory issue, that there was limited economic inventory, especially because the inventory they had was going to produce over time more liquids, rich gas than it was going to produce oil. So they went out and started buying land in an area that they had identified that was going to be highly productive. And they started redirecting their development into that area. And so um, as, as they did that, um, they, um, they looked sort of dumb because they were buying land at a time when no one else was buying it. And then they were buying it in an area that was sort of out of favor. And they also still were drilling wells on their legacy land, which made their sort of gas percentage look higher and it sort of it made it made what they were doing not look so great but it, it was really good and they bought tens of thousands of acres tens of thousands of acres in Howard County and um what was it, it was western glasscock which is actually not so bad and then recently they bought some in Upton and and these are not areas that people really thought of as great Howard County some of the best oil wells now in the western half um in the Permian are are, are getting drilled in the western half of Howard County and this area, they did great until last year when they decided to start drilling three mile laterals, which are great for gas. They're not such a good idea for oil, especially in this area that, that they were drilling them in and sort of on the fringe, on the edge of their land, um, they drilled a few wells that were very disappointing. And so that crushed their stock, especially because they were sort of this transition story and people I think never fully bought into this land acquisition strategy that they had. And so, um, I don't know. It sort of felt weird to me to be able to buy more of the stock, you know, post name change, which was sort of weird, um, post operations issue that was sort of, it looks like one off and they fired that COO that, that was sort of running that. And um, those wells even are doing a little better than it looked like they were doing uh, when it looked really bad last year for them. So, you know, if they were going to produce 20,000 barrels of oil each, now maybe they're going to produce 60,000. So mm -hmm. still bad, but <laughs> 60,000 is three times <laughs> better. It's a, a third less bad. So, or two right. and Josh, I'm just put, putting the puzzle pieces together. So the yeah. former name was Laredo Petroleum, as the petroleum suggests, that suggests oil. So they then plow all this money and it turns out it's a lot of gas and, you know, not as much oil as people said. Okay, that's the way the name change. I, I get that. Um, so, but you know, negatives in the past can be can be positive. And you're looking for you know a, a big success story for your fund uh, was Sandridge, a company that you bought, uh, and it, you know, it emerged from bankruptcy, so it traded at a pre, at a, a, you know, a very large discount. Um, and you know that that stock has done quite well. Josh, uh, great to have you here. Uh, um, you know, people should check out uh, um, Bison Interest, and of course on Twitter, as they can see, you are at Josh underscore Young underscore One. Final question for you is. What is a company in your world, not large cap, small and mid cap oil, that it just doesn't do it for you? You, you think, think it's really overrated. You see people talk about it on Twitter all the time and you think, God, like uh, this is, this people are too bullet. Like I, I love oil, small and mid cap oil stocks, but, but this one is, is overrated. Yeah. So I actually, I posted, posted about it recently. I don't own it. I'm not short it. I just, it just, it's sort of, yeah. Like, I think it's a good, this is a good question. I mostly try to stay away from talking about these things. Um, but, but occasionally I'll sort of <laughs> go in. So high peak energy, 
um, HPK. Uh, so it was a Jim Cramer favorite. So on Twitter, people will immediately go and short the stock because he liked it or whatever. But it was very odd. I think that that it got talked about on CNBC, given that it was a it's a post SPAC, which is I don't know if that's good or bad, but yeah. you know, energy most of the former the companies that have gone public via SPACs haven't done very well. Um, you know, and I know some of the board members and I think they're like, they're pretty good. And some of the companies they've been involved with have done well. It's not that I think it's badly governed. It's that the, the whole idea, so they're in Eastern Howard County. And so having done a ton of work on Vital, uh, formerly Laredo and various other companies in Howard, as well as trying to understand as a non-geologist and non-engineer, why it matters so much that you're sort of in Northwest Howard and not Southeast Howard. Looking at a company in Southeast Howard, I mean, it's very, very interesting and it's sort of the cautionary tale. So they drilled a bunch of single wells on pads um, across their land position to sort of claim to prove that it was gonna be highly productive. And in my understanding, and I don't own the stock, I'm not recommending people short or anything like that, but in my understanding, um, when they've gone back in and drilled multiple wells on that land um, per uh, per section, so when they go from one well to four wells or eight wells, um, the well productivity, in my understanding, has fallen a lot. And it looks like the market is pricing in high well productivity when the reality is that the wells are much less productive. And then I have this example of these Laredo wells or vital wells that are right on the edge in an area that actually in theory should be better than much of High Peaks land position um, that, that haven't done that great. And then when I look at other operators in that area and look at their well results, generally speaking, they when, when they drill single wells, they're not necessarily bad. It's possible to drill a single well that's highly economic when you try to get to this multi-billion dollar valuation that High Peak has for that size land position, you really sort of need, especially when you burden the infrastructure cost, right? You can't just drill a well and produce it. You have to drill a well, frack it, and then tie it in to a gas gathering system, to oil and gas processing and separation. And especially when you have high rate wells, which hopefully you're getting, um, it's very expensive to have those sorts of, that sort of infrastructure. So generally you, you wanna drill multiple wells on a single pad and on a single section of land to be able to get um, economies of scale on your infrastructure. So uh, it, people don't talk about this much because if you drill four wells or eight wells or whatever per section, the infrastructure doesn't matter that much. If you drill one well or two wells, it matters a lot more. And my understanding and the people I've consulted with who either run private oil companies in the area or are you know, geologists or geophysicists or engineers, um, their assessment is that, that this land is not supportive of high production rates on multiple wells per section. And so just the valuation, it doesn't really hold up. Um, and it's sort of similar in some regards to other sort of post-SPAC oil companies where they come out promising really high oil production growth on land that it just doesn't, when you check with the experts, they like sort of don't, it doesn't register. Uh, it doesn't seem very likely. And so this is a sort of similar one. It had this huge run up. It's had a pullback, but you know, when I look at it versus other companies, even in that area with superior positions in terms of where, where the wells they're drilling are located, it just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't own it. Again, not recommending anyone do anything with it and right. people should do their own diligence, but um, you know, that that's one that I, I, I don't get. I don't understand why it's a $20 stock and not a $5 stock. That, that's really interesting. I uh, follow SPACs pretty closely. And even though you know in the oil world, it, stock has not performed that well in relative to the oil world, it's one of the best performing SPACs because it's compete. It's, you know, it's an oil stock. Oil sector has been up a lot and it's competing you know, against a lot of speculative technology company that made all these promises about flying, you know, plane, uh, you, know, you know, electric planes and everything uh, that, you know, a lot, a lot, there's, there are a lot of bankruptcies and, you know, some of the coast companies have gone um, bankrupt uh, within months. Well, Josh, it was, it was a pleasure to, to get and uh, hear your insight. I think that the, the last time you were, you were on uh, oil prices were, were very high and uh, you know, it's good to hear your analysis now that we're sort of at a, at a, a middle um, level and, uh, yeah. Th thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Hopefully next time oil prices are, are way higher, not way lower. And yeah. We'll, we'll see how the, uh, your floor of a hundred dollars <laughs> goes out. Uh, I like that. All right. Thanks Josh. And thanks everyone for watching.
Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at Blockworks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and Blockworks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.